Good afternoon, everyone. And on behalf of the PKE Alumni Planning Committee, I am Amy Towner, PKE 139, and I would like to welcome you to the PKE Faculty Speaker Series with the PKE Committee Chair and Assistant Professor of Marketing, Dr. Jim Salas, who will discuss understanding Generation Z, the next wave of consumers and what you should know. So I want to remind everyone that this event is being recorded. So just so you're aware of that. Oh, there it is. There's the PKE Planning Committee. So again, if you do have any questions, just go ahead and pop them in the chat. So if you're interested in supporting our alumni events or, and fostering connections within your cohort, please be sure to reach out to one of the Planning Committee members or Nicole in the alumni office, or you can join us on Pep Connect. Pep Connect, um, we also have a PKE group where we can post PKE events and information. So all the information is right there for you. And then um, another way for us to help PKE stay strong is by recommending others for PKE or other degree programs. So Pearl Quintana is your contact. Thank you, Pearl. And we'd also like to acknowledge our executive associates who support the Graduadio Business School and its philanthropic efforts. So we would invite you to register for our next session <clears throat> up on Wednesday, May 24th with Dr. Soren Eilertsen. And that um, the link is, you can find the link and uh, they will be included in the emails. And at this time, I would like to introduce you to today's presenter, Dr. Salas. So thank you so much, Dr. Salas. Jim Salas is an assistant professor of marketing in the Graduadio School of Business and Management at Pepperdine University. He attended Arizona State University, where he earned an MBA and a PhD at the W.P. Carey School of Business. Prior to his career in academia, Professor Salas spent more than a decade in corporate sales and most of that time with AT&T and the business services division, serving in a variety of sales, sales management, and consulting positions. Currently, Dr. Salas consults for a medical technology incubator, medical device manufacturer, home builder, a variety of firms in the IT software industries on issues relating to marketing strategy, branding, sales, and service management strategy, and new business ventures. When not working, Dr. Salas, a father of two, enjoys spending time with his family, traveling, backpacking, hiking, cycling, and exploring our national and state parks and museums. His wife is a nurse practitioner who specializes, specializes in gerontology, and he, is, he and his family are active parishioners at St. Pascal Bailon Catholic Church and an avid Dodgers fan. Let's see. And with that, we'd love to just introduce uh, Dr. Salas. I'll be monitoring the chat, Dr. Salas, if that's okay with you. And yes, I'll absolutely. Okay, I'll just prompt you if something comes up, but welcome everyone. And we're looking forward to getting started. We'll take it away. Sounds good. Thank you, everybody. Hopefully you guys can all see my slides here. Uh, let's kind of get into this. Uh, we'll be talking today about Generation Z and some uh, tidbits of what I think all of you should know about this exciting new rising and growing uh, generation. So I'll start a little bit talking about who is Gen Z. We'll always begin with definitions. Uh, talk about why we should care, why I think it's important, what's different about them compared to other past generations. We'll kind of consider them as a consumer class some things we need to know about them, and also look at it from a global perspective. Uh, Gen Z is actually one of the largest global segments around. And I'm also gonna walk you through some very brief case studies of two companies or brands that I think are doing the most to capitalize on this new rising consumer class. I'll talk about how the pandemic has affected Gen Z and give you some tips about how to engage them and how to work with them. And if we have some time at the end, I do have uh, some marketing trends we can, we can look at and review with some, with some key takeaways. So with that, let's get started. So Generation Z, what are we talking about? We call them Zoomers, Gen Zers, whole variety of names that we give to this generation. And the reality, guys, is that this whole idea of generational research is not exactly a hard science, just looking at the literature. But we do think there are some common experiences, uh, common values shared by different generational classes. And this is what we're going to talk about. So who is Gen Z? Well, 
there's a lot of debate about what the cutoff years are, but just to kind of speak in terms of generalities, I like going to Pew. Pew, I think, is kind of the gold standard when it comes to some of this work. They define it as anybody born after 1996. And there really isn't an established cutoff. Um, I've been hearing 2010 is kind of the cutoff for Gen Z, but it gives you an idea who we're talking about. The one thing that makes this generation a little bit different from the past is that they tend to be highly collaborative. Uh, they value flexibility. We'll talk about that some more. Uh, relevance and authenticity. You'll see authenticity come up a lot throughout our, our talk today. And this last point about they prefer in-person contact the literature was a little bit all over the place on this. Some studies say they prefer in-person contact. Some of them say they don't. So there's some nuance here that really driven by context. And hopefully we'll be able to get into some of those details as well. So as you can see, I don't know where you see yourself on this generational spectrum here. Myself, I'm firmly in the Gen Z, excuse me, Gen X uh, category. Some of you may be millennials. We might have a few baby boomers here, here and there. But this is kind of what we're talking when we're talking about Gen Z. So why should we care about Gen Z? Well, because they have lots of money. They spend about $143 billion annually, and they make up about 68 million, uh, million people and growing. Uh, pretty soon, they'll make up 40% of US consumers, and they're on track to surpass even the big demographic group, which is millennials, which has been the biggest one that we've seen in years past in just a few years. Now, Gen Zers do very much value diversity, and they do want to work with people with diverse, not just backgrounds, but skill sets, education levels. So they look at diversity very, very broadly than generations in the past. And much more than other generations that I've seen in, in working with them, they really do genuinely care about society, the environment, things that um, came up in previous generations, but I think it's much more salient for this group particularly. Um, so Gen Z is different, I would argue, in, in many ways, but I think one of the biggest ones that stands out for me is this idea that they're the most racially and ethically diverse generation we've ever had. So for them, diversity is like, it's like a basic minimum. They don't even question it. It's as natural as breathing to them. And when they find themselves in situations or dealing with institutions that don't reflect that, they just get uncomfortable. And it's amazing when you, when you talk to them and you talk to them about this particular issue, they're just very, very passionate about it. They're also on pace to become the most educated generation we've ever had. And I think that has a lot of implications for businesses in terms of how you relate to them, how do you engage them with content. Uh, that'll certainly be really, really, um, really relevant. And they're also the true digital natives. And by that is that they've grown up with technology from the moment they were born. Many of them in their crib were given, you know, an iPhone and a, and a rattle, right, at, right at, at the same time. So they're definitely very, very familiar with technology. Most of them have no memory of the world before smartphones. I know my kids look at the world before, you know, pre-iPhone and post-iPhone. So it's definitely very much kind of inherent to their DNA. On social and cultural issues, they typically model millennials, which is the previous generation to them. They're definitely much more progressive, much more pro-government, but they do view the growing racial and ethnic diversity of the country as a good thing. And unlike older generations, this is kind of a surprise to me, they don't see the United States as being superior to other nations. They view us as just one of many different types of government, different types of representatives around the UN. So they definitely don't have this, you know, the US is, is, is a special, you know, kind of a, a nation, very, very different and in a class of its own. They kind of view us pretty much on par with other countries. So if we kind of dig into this a little bit more closely, we can see that in a few years, Gen Z will become majority non-white. But in particular, you can see a quarter of them right now are Hispanic. This is growing. You can see the portion of the Asian population also growing much more faster than previous generations. Uh, the, the, the black segment's actually shrinking just a little bit. And you have this category of other. So this can be other ethnic groups, or it could just be them choosing not to, not to identify. So we talked about how on social issues are very similar to millennials. 
One of the things that's really interesting is that they are definitely at the forefront when it comes to a lot of the political social issues of the day. So for example, they very much, just like millennials, believe that gay marriage is a good thing uh, compared to other generations. You can see the differences there is actually quite stark. And they also are at the forefront of our rapidly evolving ideas about gender identity. They're much more comfortable using gender neutral pronouns than I think previous generations. As you can see the breakup here of those who kind of um, describe their sexuality in different types of ways than maybe generations in the past. So for example, Gen Z, you can see most of that generation identifies as heterosexual where you see Gen Z, you see much more diversity of where they are on that gender, gender identity spectrum. So this is kind of interesting. I came across this book called The Gen Z Effect. And the authors are arguing that there are these six forces that are shaping the future of business driven by this generation. And I thought this particular table that they had was really interesting. They were looking at things that were happening before Gen Z and then what, are, what happens as we transition to what they call Gen Z as being the new standard of what demographic segments should look like. So you can see we go from the idea of internet access being a privilege where they see it as a human right. Uh, influence, you can buy it where they see it as you earn it. The other one I thought was very interesting was this idea of connectivity. Connectivity before it was looked at as a luxury, but now it's a necessity. And I think that's what's really interesting uh, to me about this particular generation is the things that we took for granted, things that were extra, that were luxury items, this new generation sees as a basic common denominator. And I think there are opportunities here where businesses fail them, like on this issue of connectivity. Do we really provide an omni-channel experience to this segment? Can we let them engage with us on a variety of different platforms, technologies? And I'll get back to that a little bit more when I talk about some of those case studies. Um, so again, factors that kind of shape this, this generation compared to the one before the millennials. We talked about technology being a big one. I also, this came up again and again in the research about mental health how compared to millennials, they definitely seem to have higher levels of depression and anxiety. Uh, the literature is kind of a little bit uh, all over the place in terms of, is this really higher levels or are we just measuring higher levels that were already there? And I've found good evidence that argue both, both sides of that. Uh, this is definitely a generation that's much more comfortable speaking about mental health challenges than previous generations. So they're not shy about you know, seeking those, those counseling services and mental health services that are, that are available to them. Um, and then again, from this idea of being more individualistic, less social, where millennials were much more group oriented and, and more social. Again, that social stuff kind of comes up again and again, and we already talked about diversity. So this is something I found from McKinsey. Uh, we, again, talking about how they differ. What I thought was really interesting here is look at the, the column there about behavior comparing to past uh, generations, they talk about Gen Zers be, being a communi communicaholic. This idea that you can't over communicate with them. Um, I know in the past when I was talking about millennials, we're talking about millennials want weekly insight. Gen Zs very, very much the same way. They want you to touch base with them almost on a daily basis about how are they doing. Um, and that's really important to them. You can't over communicate with them. They definitely want to engage, uh, they call this idea this dialogue. They want to have a dialogue. Uh, they hate this kind of one-way bashing. They reject our current political environment where you have the hard right and the hard left going at it. They definitely want to see more of this engagement of a give and take. And they see it as kind of um, where consumption in the past may have been about possession. They view consumption as this expression of their individual identity. Right, so it's definitely for them an ethical concern, what they buy, what they support, what brands they associate the, themselves with. But they also do it from a very realistic frame of mind, which I thought was really, really interesting. So let's look at them specifically as a consumer class, like what motivates them? Why, why do they go, why do they buy things? And I think the one word that kind of sums this up based on the research is it's the search for truth. And McKinsey had this great uh, article where they talk about how 
their search for truth is really the foundation of everything they do from a purchasing behavior standpoint. So for example, this idea about how they express themselves. So they don't believe they can, they should define themselves in one particular way. They want to try on identities the way you and I would try on clothes, you know, for, for a day, for a week, for a month. Uh, they also want to be what they call radically inclusive. So they want to connect to what they see as different truths. I have a truth, you, you have a truth, and this idea that we're all equally weighted. And again, they want fewer confrontations, more dialogue. They want to understand different perspectives of what they call understand different truths. And the whole realistic element of this is to live their lives pragmatically. So this idea that I want to uncover what's behind the underlying essence of all the things I, I interact with, whether it's my brands, it's the things that I buy, the things I experience. Again, this idea of truth, authenticity kind of rings through over and over again. And if we look at them a little bit more closely, we'll see that obviously I think social media is going to have a greater influence on this generation than maybe any others. But here's what's kind of paradoxical about them. They certainly like brick and mortar stores. They actually like brick and mortar much more than millennials, for example, because for them, it's a, it's a way for them to stay connected. It's for them to have a dialogue with their brands, to experience their brands in a physical sense, not just a digital sense. Uh, so again, even though they were the first to kind of grow up with online shopping and they definitely embraced it, but they certainly still want to have that in-store experience. And I think that's where this idea of an omni-channel uh, perspective is really, really important to them. So we continue here. They, they, Gen Zers definitely want to stand out. So while brands are, they'll say that's not that important to them. It's really about what those brands stand for. Um, and they typically are not one to always go, you know, looking for the next unique thing. Again, they want to root themselves firmly in experiences and brands that cater to that are going to be much more along uh, the follow the attributes that they're looking for in brands. So they're definitely more apt to look at things like hobbies and home entertainment, where millennials, for example, they like to splurge on, on travel and luxury hotels. Gen Zers kind of rein that in a little bit more. 40% uh, of adult Gen Zers say that their purchasing decisions were most influenced by social media, where again, compared to other generations, it's not that big of an effect. And if we look at what the things they're spending money on, well, it's interesting because although they certainly do splurge on technological experiences like video games and things like that, they just want to uh, buy technology that helps them help fun, uh, uh, have fun. So 80% of Gen Zers say that they will wait for an item to go on sale before buying it, for example. In the health and wellness category, it's actually the second highest category of what Gen Z spends on. And um, this group is actually a leader in the whole health and wellness movement compared to other generations. And they're looking for brands that support things like mental health, ethical food sourcing, and anything else related to wellness issues. According to the consumer report, 60% of Gen Zers will actually choose a product based on it being made by a small business than maybe a large corporation. Again, they're really into supporting these, these smaller organizations, rooting for the little guy. And they're also more likely to invest in courses or educational programs that advance their future earnings. This is why we're saying that they're becoming the most educated consumer class that we've seen. So how do they decide what to buy? You can see here, this chart broke down Gen Zers by older and younger Gen Zers. You can see where social media drives a lot of it. One of the things that I thought was interesting, look at the influence of friends and family, especially on the older Gen Zer demographic. That's an eight point difference than millennials in the past. I thought that was really interesting. Um, and I think what you're seeing here is we're losing that market share to social media. I think uh, for that particular older Gen Z market, social media influencers is definitely taking over um, in terms of how they form opinions about brands or trying different things. If we consider Gen Z's as kind of a, from a global perspective, there's some interesting things that come about as well. Um, for number one, you can see that globally, Gen Z represent about a third of the total world population. Uh, so it's definitely the, the largest population cohort. It, it's about 2.5 billion people. 
And they also have the fastest growing income. Uh, so we can see that it's expected to quadruple to about $33 trillion very, very soon, which is just absolutely amazing. Um, if we look at uh, Gen Zs globally, there was some research that came out of Brazil that I thought was really interesting. Just to give you an idea of comparison, Brazil is considered to be kind of a very conservative, very religious kind of, kind of country. And you can see their Gen Zs, 24% of them identify as atheists or having no religion uh, affiliation. This is interesting because in the US, uh, more than a third identify as uh, religiously unaffiliated, which I think is you know, really interesting. And even in conservative countries like Brazil, you're seeing Gen Zers kind of move away from, again, institutions and establish, but they definitely relate themselves high in terms of if you're a spiritual person. They'll definitely kind of categorize them uh, themselves that way. And you can also see where they stand on issues like decriminalization of marijuana and things of that nature. Um, nine out of 10 Gen Zers live in Asia. So if you wanna go follow the global uh, market for Gen Z. Asia is definitely the place to, to do that. Um, in particular, I was just reading the New York Times this morning, and this is just fresh off the presses in this morning's New York Times, this chart came up where India is expected to surpass China in terms of world population. Some uh, researchers have argued that's already happened. It happened about two weeks ago from what I've read. So now it's 1.4 billion billion people. So there's kind of this mantra for this century will be the Indian century. And uh, considering that, you know, they aligned with, you know, English speaking democracy, I would expect us to see a lot more investment, a lot more business dealings in India. And if you're going to do that, that means you're going to be dealing with Gen Zers in India more and more. That's kind of a note to my colleague Demos. We got to put India back on the, uh, on the PKE executive trips for, for sure. Um, so if we look at Gen Z, especially from an Asian Pacific perspective, um, they're very optimistic. You can see by the first statistic that's in there, more than three quarters think that their lives will be better than their parents' generation. Uh, but in China, um, it's actually 94%, which is just amazing. Uh, Thailand, Vietnam, you can see the numbers there. This follows my own personal experience when I traveled to, to India and, um, and, and Thailand. Definitely very, very entrepreneur, very, very optimistic. Um, you can see they use their smartphones multiple times a day. So that mobility is everything, especially on a global market where you're more likely to have a smartphone than a, than, than a laptop or a PC. And you can see three quarters of them are very comfortable buying online China with the highest rates of 88%. And 88% of them think that it's important for them to start saving for their future. And they wish they had more education around financial literacy. I'm seeing that come up again and again. Some research I did for a home builder a few weeks ago, we found that 28% of Gen Zers don't know how much, um, uh, how much of a monthly mortgage they can afford for a new home. So we definitely see a gap in financial literacy that I think represents an opportunity for businesses to come and fill it. Um, some more APAC um, um, information. So again, looking at those in Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand and whatnot, they're more likely to pick family members as personal he uh, heroes than secondly followed by their teachers. But in Hong Kong and China and Taiwan, Taiwan, they're more likely to pick celebrities as their, as their heroes, where young people in China look at scientists, entrepreneurs, and, and politicians in high esteem. Again, if you're looking about what influences them, how do they connect with people, these are important things to, to know. Eight out of 10 say that gender uh, doesn't define a person as much as it used to, which is really interesting, considering where the state is coming from. And 75% say they would date outside of their race. Again, very, very different than in previous generations. And more than half are trying to eat less meat than in the past. So again, we're even seeing changes in terms of consumption around food or on diets. Uh, which is following uh, trends, not just in Asia, but actually the US and Europe as well. So I thought I would just take a second here and just talk a little bit about two case studies I came across. Uh, this is all from Passport. This is a database you have available to you as a student here at Pepperdine. And these are two companies that I thought were doing some really, really great engagement with this generation using some of the insights of what I talked about a moment ago. So the first one that I liked a lot was Gucci. 
uh, Kuchi does this really cool thing. They're actually involved with video games and developing, um, partnering with video, video game developers. And they have this online gaming platform with Roblox called Gucci Garden, where you basically get to you know, interact with different kinds of unique art, fashion installations. You can get digital Gucci branded fashion items. And here's the really cool thing. I know from having a young son who's into playing video games, the big thing is you buy skins, you buy wardrobe in these games. Well, Gucci has partnered with these, with these uh, developers and the key insight here is you can buy Gucci digitally branded uh, skins or outfits that your character can wear. Um, and this is a just, just kind of a really neat way to engage with them, right? Especially being a luxury uh, provider. And this allows them to kind of get into this space, get into them where they're very, very young, make them lifelong Gucci brands. And it's also a way for them interacting with people. This is a luxury brand interacting with consumers that may not be able to afford the real life product, but they can definitely have a taste of the experience in the digital space. So there's kind of a, a whole democratizing luxury element here that I think is a fascinating concept, and I'd like to pursue this a little bit more from, from a research perspective, but just a really, really great, great example. And again, the last bullet point there in that blue box, a quarter of Gen Zers play video games on a daily basis. If any of you guys are parents, you already know this. <laughs> but again, the fact that businesses are meeting them where they are, I think that's just an amazing opportunity and some great insight on behalf of Gucci. Um, the other example is Nika. Uh, Nika is an Indian brand. This is a fascinating company, by the way. If you haven't checked them out, uh, please look them up. They're an Indian e-commerce company founded by uh, Falguni Ayar in 2012, headquartered in Mumbai. They sell beauty, wellness, fashion products across their websites and mobile apps and 100 different uh, affiliate stores. And in 2020, they were the first Indian unicorn startup headed by a woman, which is really, really cool. The insight here, what they're doing is they're really taking this idea of engagement on a different level. So they can establish consumer platforms where consumers can go learn, read product reviews and get recommendations, not just from beauty experts, but from peers. And this is the idea where they're opening up the back end of their platform and letting users interact, share tips, beauty ideas, best practices, what works, what doesn't. And the idea that they're providing this platform, not only is it good for market intelligence, find out which products are performing well, what are the attributes consumers want, but it's literally providing a brand experience to where you have this communal effect of young women helping other young women learn more about what works for them, what doesn't. Um, it's, just, it's just a really, really neat engagement vehicle. The technology in which they do this is amazing. Again, check it out, look at some of their VR uh, platforms that, that they're playing with. Um, just very, very impressive. Again, these are brands that are meeting this generation where they are on their terms and the, and the way that they, they wanna be uh, treated and interacted with. So check them out if you haven't had a chance to, to do so. So let's talk a little bit about the pandemic, right? Because I think this pandemic in particular had a huge effect on, on Gen Z and it's worth considering some of those, those things. There are basically, I think, three basic things uh, that really kind of affected Gen Z. It definitely activated their activism. Um, it definitely challenged their mental health. Um, and it redefined how they find meaning, not just amongst brands, but even meaning at work and their personal lives. So the, there are these five, uh, Ernst & Young did this report where they identified five Gen Z consumer segments. And what they wanted to do was to measure these segments and by their population size before the pandemic and then after the pandemic. So one of the first uh, demographic groups they identified was this, they call it stress drivers. These are high achievers driven by fear of not being good enough. And their key attributes are their future focus, they're independent and they're anxious. What's interesting is that when they did the study, they found no change in the size of this population pre or post pandemic. Then you had another group they identified as authentic activists. Again, they're motivated by trying to do good in the world, their, fee, their fear is that, you know, uh, what will happen if they're not successful and they're very much open-minded, determined, passionate. We saw these folks increase by the tune of 6%. Um, then we have the big dreamers. 
they are expected to do things well, make money, but not necessarily willing to put in the effort. Attributes here are low energy. They put an emphasis on lifestyle, live in the moment. Again, we saw no change in the size of that, of that particular group. Another one, secluded perfectionists, focused on loving what they do, being the best, not for money or accolades. And their attributes, they're intrinsically motivated, right? They're motivated by their internal drive, passionate, driven. We saw this group grow to the tune of 5%. And the in most interesting one for me is this last one, this carefree constituents. They're kind of the go with the flow. While they may not drive change, they'll be the ones to adopt it into the mainstream. They're open-minded, live in the moment, easygoing. We saw this group grow by 11% right? Definitely much, much bigger. So the key is, how do you engage these particular consumer segments, especially these carefree constituents, right? That we saw them grow significantly. And I, what we think is that with the pandemic kind of, kind of teased to the top was this idea of them really re-examining their, their assumptions that they had, right? Things that they learned from parents, from school or different institutions. And this idea that, you know what? I think I need to live in the moment, put more emphasis on the here and now, which is why they're looking for this idea of truth, looking for authenticity. You hear this word connection uh, again and again when you interact with them. Now to pivot a little bit about working with, Jay -Z, with Gen Zs, I think this creates a whole host of different challenges and opportunities. And if you look at five main challenges, we can see that there are different views of the importance of empathy between generations. Uh, Gen Z workers highly value empathy as a part of, um, on the part of their supervisors or who they work for. They consider it kind of a basic prerequisite of, of engaging at work. But the reality is that supervisors and most, most bosses they work for just don't place that high value upon demonstrated empathy. Uh, Gen Z workers also feel they're not getting enough mental health support they need in the workplace. And they believe their ideas on mental health impacts work. Uh, impacts on work is very different than those the folks that they're working for. Uh, like for example, Gen Z workers and their bosses will put a different uh, value, uh, values upon work being a part of their personal identities, where Gen Zers don't really look at it that way. They're the generation that's least likely to say they'll go above and beyond at work and uh, do what's what's required of them. And again, this comes back to this idea of like, you know, work is just not important part of their identity of how they define themselves or maybe as a gen xer or a boomer many times our work consumes us right and defines us we also see that they feel they're getting insufficient training and job readiness so um, this is probably the big thing here and i see this correlate with what i see in my own experience working with different companies they have less formal training sessions less formal onboarding um, processes uh, that I have found in practice. So they think they're underprepared, they're undertrained for their jobs. They struggle to address those deficiencies, especially when they're working in a virtual work environment. And I think that's where it's very easy to be neglected, right? And this is where, especially if you're working in a virtual office or you do a hybrid work environment, it's really important that you reach out and really give them the support that they, that they need. I have some more ideas on this in a second. And again, there's this differences in reward and recognition structure. So again, Gen Zers, they put much more of an emphasis on getting um, uh, time off, right? They value that much more where the people they work for, they rank it number 12. So you can see there's definitely a contrast in ideas of what type of reward mechanisms works best for them. And I think oftentimes we forget time off. For them, time is so valuable, reinforced through the experiences with the pandemic, that we forget that's a very great tool to use as incentives. So how do we address these? How do we, how do we bridge these gaps? Well, first of all, be conscious of them, right? Recognize uh, the, the issues that we're talking about. So as a business leader, your relationship with your Gen Z employees might fall into one of three, three different gaps. So the first one we call the knowledge gap, this idea that you don't fully understand what Gen Z wants, uh, but you may agree with them that maybe change is necessary, but just don't know what should change, right? Call it a knowledge gap. Then there's an alignment gap where you might understand what Gen Zers want, but you might disagree of whether you need to change anything. And then we have an execution gap where you might agree with them, on, there has to be a change, but you 
don't have a plan or a way of delivering on those desired changes. So whether it's a, a knowledge, alignment, or execution gap, uh, these are all represent opportunities about how you might go about bridging some of these gaps. And here's some tactical ideas. So first one is, you know, be curious. Look at data from your industry, look at across industries, explore how you can build trust with Gen Zs. Remember, they're on the search for truth. The truth, a big part of that is trusting you. I'm trusting that your truth is what you say it is, that it is authentic. And then you have to connect, right? Create opportunities for connections, not just between your, the folks that work for you, but for the workers across different generations. And the key here is that you need to be intentional, be purposeful. Technology can help with this in terms of virtual you know, coffee and, and, and connection kind of thing, something I, I've been involved with in the past. So there's a lot of creative ways to create these connections, but definitely make it part of your strategic processes. Co-create. Gen Zers, at the end of the day, just want to be part of the process. They want to sit at the table. So bring them into the problem-solving process. Enlist their energy. Enlist their creativity. I'm telling you, sometimes all you have to do is you know, put the Legos on the table and just step back and they can create some amazing things. Uh, definitely build a culture of reverse mentoring. Gen Zers love this. Uh, encourage them to help some of the older employees understand not just the generation, but understand some things that maybe they're not great at, whether it's technology, whether it's different ways of, uh, of interacting. That's a real nice and easy way to also help bolster those connections I talked about a moment ago. Uh, and then ask the influencers. Um, again, I mentioned before, they're already taking adv advice from social media influencers. The reality is that every organization, every institution has people inside and outside of the organization that are thought leaders. And your challenge is to identify who they are, especially within the Gen Z group, and enlist their help. You know, test some ideas, help them craft some ideas about how to engage with them and, and, and bridge some of these gaps identified before. Um, going to end here. I'm going to leave some time for questions here at the very, very back. I have some statistics that I try to pull some of these and some of the insights we were talking about earlier, but there's some just some stats and trends I want to share with you. Some of them are on iChart, so I apologize, but this is being recorded. So if you want to go back and listen to this, you can pause and, and check out some of these stats that might particularly uh, of interest to you. So here's some cool stats about Gen Z. 77% um, will will take some form of action for a cause they believe in. That's off the charts compared to previous uh, generations. My other favorite one is almost a quarter of them have even boycotted a brand. I know in my household, I have two Gen, Gen Zers in, in my household, and I'm always being told or being disappointed in their eyes because I, I, I buy from brands that they've, you know, voted down a long, long time ago for whatever reasons. Uh, I mentioned they already buy stuff based on influencers' recommendations, but they say they're willing to pay more, about 10% more, for sustainable products. Um, um, I love having this conversation in class with them. Um, and I think the data does, 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 um, does tease out, but I'm always curious about what are the categories of things you're willing to pay more for? That's a kind of interesting conversation in and of itself. 90% of Gen Zers are willing to buy on credit compared to millennials, um, where 30% of them will do the same. So that's an interesting drop, right? So if you're in a financial institution, Gen Zers are less willing to buy on credit than previous generation. And 157% um, conversion rate on a mobile web session. That's just amazing. To me, that tells me that if you want to get into this market, mobility is the bridge. You have to have a strong mobile platform, mobile presence to, to convert this particular demographic. Here's some additional stats, and I'm sorry again for the eye chart. I'm just going to pick out a couple of things that stood out to me. Again, you can watch the recording and pause on the slide. But what I thought was interesting um, and a little bit scary is that number eight, 31% of young internet users are not afraid to share their sensitive data online. So bank account, passwords, things like that. I think that's interesting. It might even uh, be interesting from a risk assessment standpoint, uh, according to your, your policies and, and processes. Um, other one that I like here is where they spend, half of them spend at least five hours a day on their smartphones. That's not, not surprising. And the last statistic there, 
where we have 15 million teenagers in the US who own smart wearables. This could be smart watches. Very soon you're gonna see smart clothing, workout clothes that have embedded sensors that can tell you how good of a workout that you had. I've seen these, these demos, they're amazing, they're really cool and they're coming to a store near you. It's really the personification of the internet of things that we've been uh, talking about for years. And this next slide, again, I know, I know it's an R chart, I chart, but what really kind of sticks out with me here on, on this one is this idea that 45% uh, of them watch cable TV compared to previous generations. So what this means is that less and less of this demographic is watching normal cable television. You can see their big Netflix subscribers, streaming services, right, is, is kind of where you're going to reach them from, from a television perspective. And then the uh, last one, I think interesting too, where almost 43% of young adults submit product reviews regularly. Um, I would venture most of the Amazon reviews that you've read have been written by this particular demographic. The, um, some of them that I, I have seen can be very thoughtful, some of them not so much. But, but again, if you provide a negative customer experience for this generation, they're not shy about letting the world know. And you know, the, our challenge is, can we make the inverse of that be true? When we provide an exceptional customer experience, can we get them to share that with the world as well? So just some key takeaways from our talk, and then I'm gonna open up for some questions. So the big thing is that Gen Z is here, as much as we, we, we may not want it to be, and understanding them, how to engage them, how to tell their story and your brand in a way that's authentic, in a way that speaks to a truth that they care about. I think can, can make you very, very successful. They are different and we got to acknowledge that. And you can try to you know, combat that, change it or accept them for who they are and meet them where they are and come up with strategies and techniques to engage with them at a deep level. Hopefully I reviewed some of those ways and best practices of how to do that. So again, our challenge is how do we continually learn to appeal, to influence or to relate to them so this future is happening, it is now, but I do wanna share a little bit more with you. I wanna share with you some interesting phrases that come from Gen Z, and I think it's important that all of us know what they mean. So here's some slang. Uh, have you guys heard this one, okay, boomer? It's a phrase, somewhat controversial, some would say, but this is really their dismissive response to anybody they think is like older, like anything, anybody over 30, I think <laughs> they'll, they'll say this. And the, the example here is like, you should get a checkbook for your bank account, okay, boomer. That's the response to, to, to something like that. It can be very, very dismissive. I hear this a lot around my household, even though I remind my children, I'm not a boomer. Uh, quaking, another, another fun slang term. It means shocked or surprised in a positive way. You can see the example I have here is my cooking so good, Gordon Ramsay's quick. Uh, my favorite and my kids time I use it wrong all the time is extra. It's when you're dramatic, you're attention grabbing or you're too much. So the example here is you don't have to be so extra about it. Uh, bougie, another favorite that I, I see uh, again and again. It means rich, luxurious, special, fancy. The example here is you're so bougie with that Louis Vuitton bag. And then my personal favorite one is basic. It's an insult. That means something or someone is boring or uncool. Let's get out of here. This party is basic. Um, I get accused by my kids all the time of being basic, but I personally view it as a badge of honor. So that's my presentation. Um, love to take any questions anybody might have. That that was awesome, and um, I was, I hope I didn't distract you with all the comments I was making because I can relate. Um, the one thing I I wanted to know the first thing I want to know was the age group again for the Gen Z. And yeah, so nineteen ninety six to about now or twenty ten, there is this new generation people are talking about, mostly marketers to be honest with you, called Generation Alpha, and they're saying anybody born from twenty ten to to now. Um, again, they're, they're starting to kind of describe Generation Alpha in a very, very unique, unique way. But I'd say about, you know, 96 and on is what we define as Gen Z. Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. I, so obviously, yeah, I have a Gen Z in my house. So. <laughs> I got two, brother. We should have, have our own support okay. group. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. And was I correct in, in saying and in thinking and hearing from you that they kind of seem like they're they're becoming more and more um, positioned 
to be acceptable of the direction that the world is going, sustainable development goals, they're willing to be more virtual, and all these other things that you mentioned. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, Andre, absolutely. So we're like in Gen Xers. We definitely also were one of the first uh, folks around the environmental movement, but we're skeptical right? We don't think anything's really going to change. The neat thing about Gen Z, which is why I love teaching so much, they really believe they can change the world. And they're looking for businesses, career opportunities, where they have an opportunity to make a positive impact, for example, on the environment. And that's what I find so refreshing, so exciting, so hopeful for our future, and that they authentically believe that. Where for us, it's like, yeah, if and when, but it's not really going to happen. They're like, no, this is going to happen. And just, just watch. Okay. Thank you. Some familiar faces on the screen. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, did you come across anything in your research about how successful reverse mentoring is? I find this concept to be fascinating. Yeah, uh, thanks, Jolene. So one of the cool things that I always advise my students, right, especially the, the young Gen, Gen Zers, when they're out in their workforce, they're sometimes so afraid to kind of call up a senior executive and say, oh, you know, can I can you be my mentor, ask you for some advice? What I tell them is that they have something very special to share. This is where that reverse mentoring comes in. They, because they're digital natives, they intuitively get technology, but most importantly, they intuitively understand how to connect with their peers. And I think that's where older business leaders struggle with is not just with the typical technology stuff, but it's like understanding how this new consumer class interacts. How do they relate? The brand practices of the past are not going to work for the generation of today. And I think that's where we see some real efficacy in. So uh, in terms of examples, um, I know there's some companies that have tried to get formal reverse mentoring programs off the ground. There's some nonprofits I'm affiliated with back east. I haven't seen them grow to a critical success level. They're still piloting. They're still kind of trying different things. Uh, I'm not surprised. These things kind of take time. But I would love, and by the way, if anybody has a successful reverse mentoring program out there, I would love to hear about it. I'd love to write about it. It's really neat. But, uh, but I can't point to one that says, yeah, they've done this very, very well. I want to open it up to the group. Anybody have any particular examples? Just curious. No, but I think it sounds wonderful. I'm, I want to do some research and find out how, how can I put that into place here? Because I actually have a really good environment here to actually put that in place. So I'd love to get more information on that. I'm going to have to do some diligence. Yeah, Amy, you know, I was thinking about you earlier and those eye charts that I have about the stats, one of them rung out, it was 33% of Gen Zers will get a career in a healthcare space. Yeah. So I think especially for healthcare industries, this is a really, really important demographic. It certainly is because we've got a pipeline issue and we have got to do something about it. And that's another thing that I've been, even a lot of the kids that are in school and healthcare, they actually can't come and get practicum experience just because of all the rules. It's, it's a highly regulated industry. So I'm bringing on a lot of college students and really giving them an internship opportunity so that they can you know, do interviews with doctors and highlight them and so that they get to do interviews with them just finding different ways, but also allowing them to get that in-person experience that you were speaking about instead of just Zoom. And I said, this is going to be a differentiator for you against the other peers that are actually applying for jobs when you get to have an in-person experience. So I think it's incumbent upon us in the working, you know, as potential hiring uh, individuals to make sure that we provide opportunities like that for them. Absolutely. And I think especially when you offer that olive branch, again, when you engage them in a real conversation and this group, um, how do I say this in polite company, they have a very good nose for, for, for inauthenticity, for BS, right? So when you come across with them, you know, like, hey, you really care about their success. You care about them personally. You'd be surprised how they just react to that and they open up and they even perform at a higher level because again, they feel that connection with you. I would agree. I would ag definitely agree. This was so insightful. 
I, I have another comment, but I wanted to give somebody else a chance if they wanted to. All right. Well, you know, you, you mentioned opportunities for business, uh, you know, among Gen Z's. And uh, you pointed out uh, something very interesting, uh, the Gucci, Gucci and their virtual goods. You know, I was applying for a trademark uh, last year and they asked me, it, had a, it was a, on clothing, and they said, do you want to get your virtual goods trademark? And then all of a sudden, I was reading about Nike and Polo Ralph Lauren and Puma and, of course, Gucci, opening up a whole new area of liquidity for investors and et cetera, but for business as well to sell on the metaverse or whatever they want to call it. What are your thoughts on that since you mentioned it? Yeah, Andre, that's where I think this is so exciting, right? It's funny, I get asked a lot my opinion about meta and, and VR and what that looks like. Um, and I think we're still early. I think especially this Gen Z is the market that's gonna make this kind of kind of get to a critical, uh, a critical point. But this idea of owning digital IP, right? And coming up with a business model based on that, um, I'm not an attorney, but I would venture that there's some still legal challenges to be kind of uh, rectified or kind of honed out in this in this space. But what I find fascinating is that um, I don't know if you're kind of a Marvel geek like like, like I am, but sort of, yeah. you're kind of in the same world where w once you're in this 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 um, metaverse, you would now have an infinite marketplace. Right. So I think that's the exciting part for me is that now you can engage with consumers, not just their physical selves, but their digital that's selves that can, that, can, that can exist in a multiple multiverse. And I think that's the challenge for us business folks is to think about, OK, what does capitalism look like in a virtual space? Are the same rules of an open market, of a free market applicable there? I could see a scenario where you have a world that's not based on capitalistic tenants. Right, kind of as, as a fun thing to do to experience what that looks like. The question is, do you want your brand to play there? Right. Well, what is that? How does that uh, uh, fit with your, your brand positioning, your brand messaging? So, what I'm saying, Andre, there's a lot of things that are still white space that I don't have a lot of answers to, but I got a ton of questions because it's really fun. It's really exciting. And I would say, it's just a, as a good business practice, start experimenting. Again, be curious. Uh, challenge some of the members of your team, especially your business development marketing folks, to go out there, look into these new digital spaces, what's going on, what are theirs that you can possibly get some insight on to be first. Because in some of these uh, think situations, you'll have some really good first mover advantages. But also, if you've been in my classes, you also know that being a first mover isn't always the best thing to do. Yeah. Absolutely. That's what Dr. Matamidi taught us. So you, you definitely are saying the right stuff. <laughs> Kurt, the smart guy. Absolutely. Listen to Kurt. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Jim, I have a comment. This is Pearl. I was fascinated by your presentation. I felt like you were describing my two daughters. But, uh, <laughs> I was, you know, they, they have such value in what they purchase that if you can lose a customer forever, for example, my girls, if they find out that one company did something bad and I'm walking in the store, they're like, mom, we're not going in there. I said, why this incident happened? And I was like, well, it's not that big deal to me, but to them, you've lost them forever. I mean, it, it's just fascinating. I really enjoyed your presentation. It was like you were addressing my two, my two girls and their story. You can lose them forever. They will. And I said, you're never going to shop there again. They're like, no, they did this to this customer and I will never go back. And I was like, wow, that was such an interesting point. I did not know that young people are so strong about an incident that will never make them go back. They really are. And Pearl, it's funny because I know something a little bit about your girls. Mm -hmm. I know you have one who's a very big social media influencer mm -hmm. and has her own brand in retail. Mm -hmm. But what's really neat about that is that I think that's why they take this so um, personally, mm -hmm. because they're so used to sharing of themselves in a digital space that when there's what they perceive an act of transgression, the brand has failed them, has let them down. They view it as not just a commercial exchange. Mm -hmm. It's like a personal thing. It's like th that it personally failed them. And I think that's why the reaction is so visceral. I think they're a much more emotive segment in that respect, where maybe us older generations, we see things at more arm's length transactional, they really live and breathe their values and take it into, into how they how they buy things. They do. And I go in and I shop and I come back out and they're looking at me like I've done something, a crime or something. And I said, well, maybe Gen Z's are not so forgiving because I'm forgiving. And I say, well, you know, 
maybe they'll make amends with that mistake, but no, it, they take it. I don't know if maybe 10 years from now they'll go back, but it was, it was fascinating presentation. Thank you. No, thank you, Pearl. Well, we're almost up on the hour, but we wanted to make sure we thanked everyone for taking time out of their day. And thank you, Professor. This was so insightful and such rich content and really worth our time. And we really appreciate you um, offering up this incredible, incredible uh, offering. So thank you so much. My and pleasure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And also, we want to remind um, everyone, you will get an email with a, uh, a follow-up event survey. We would really like for you to, uh, to complete that because that helps fuel kind of the insights for the kind of content and how, how you enjoyed this and how we're going to continue to build our, our programming going forward. So thank you for taking the time to uh, finish and fill out that survey. So back to you, Nicole, if there's anything else. Thank you, Amy. Just thank you again, Professor. This was phenomenal. The recording will be shared once it's um, ready to send out. Um, but thank you, everyone, for joining. Have a great afternoon. Enjoy the rest of your day.